If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas, Judas saith unto him, not his carrier, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it has come to pass, that when it has come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Praise be to thee, O Christ. He shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God of one. Amen. Amen. Pentecost, like pasta, like Passover, was a feast of the Jews. They celebrated Pentecost 50 days after they celebrated the Passover. It commemorated the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, God never does things accidentally. Jesus rose in conjunction with the Passover precisely because it was the Passover from death to life. The Holy Spirit is given to the world, to the church, on Pentecost because it is the fulfillment of the law. Not its abolition. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But what Pentecost and the giving of the Spirit does is this. By fulfilling the law, it takes that which was external, that which was an external code of behavior, and makes it internal. No longer is it something that we carve on tablets and put in front of courthouses after Pentecost. It is something which comes to live within us. Shaping our vision, shaping our life, shaping our entire concept of what it is to live. That's why Jesus in Matthew, when he's teaching his disciples, says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. That's part of the external law. 
But I say unto you, any man who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. That's because now it is internal. It's not a checklist external to us, it's something which is supposed to shape how we look at the world. Pure. So the external law becomes written on our hearts, not on tablets of stone. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens, of course, is that it incorporates the apostles and all faithful believers into Christ's body, the church. The church is the guarantee of the incarnation. The church is Christ's body extended in time and space. The church is the presence of Christ amongst us. That's how he guarantees after the ascension, when he has to return to the presence of his Father in heaven, that his presence is still here. It's why I guess you can say he can be in two places at one time. He stands before the Father in heaven, we read this in Hebrews, and always makes intercession for us. That's his job description. Now. Sending the Holy Spirit from the Father to us was the last thing he had to do to equip us to live the life of the kingdom in his church in this world. That's why he returned. And sometimes people say, why do you go back? Why do you return to the presence of his Father in the heavens? And the fact is he'd done everything here he was supposed to do. There was nothing more to do other than sending the Holy Spirit from his Father to us to equip us for the lives that he called us to lead. His job now is to stand before the throne of his Father in heaven and continually offer himself to God on our behalf. Always. 24-7. What he does is stand before the throne of his Father and say, okay, Lord, I, know, I get it. They're not much. But we made it. And we went, you sent me to Salem. And I'm offering everything I did for them to you on their behalf so that they can stand with me come and, and share, eat at your table in your kingdom, which of course is his own. If he had not returned to the presence of his father in his humanity, and remember, he is still God and man. He didn't leave his humanity behind him. That makes it possible for the rest of humanity to be in the presence of God. Truly in our Lord Jesus, heaven and earth are rejoined. Truly in our Lord Jesus, we now have the power, the guidance, and the direction to return to the presence of our Father in his kingdom. That's why we come together to celebrate this Mass, this Eucharist, this liturgy, whatever one of the names of the church gives to what you wish to apply. It is something in which we join in the sharing of Christ's sacrifice of himself, his self-offering, his, as it says in the prayer of the consecration, his one oblation of himself one song. We join that with him in heaven. And what happens here doesn't happen in Omaha or in St. Louis or in Belgrade or in Damascus or in Rio de Janeiro. Because when we come together joining Christ in the presence of his Father in heaven, we ascend to heaven and heaven and earth meet. In Omaha, heaven and earth meet. In Belgrade, heaven and earth meet. In Damascus, heaven and earth meet. In Rio, in Tokyo, wherever faithful Orthodox come before the altar to join their offering with Christ's self-offering of himself. Heaven and earth meet. But the only thing that allows us to join in that is, of course, the power and grace of God's Holy Spirit. Now, people had had contact with the Holy Spirit of God prior to Pentecost. I think sometimes we get this idea that you know the Spirit wasn't present. That's not true. At the creation, you know, we're reminded in Genesis, the Spirit of the Lord moved across the face of the face, I'm sorry, the face of the waters. The acts of the Holy Trinity are always acts of three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Son, of course, is the Word incarnate, and he shows us the Father. He's as close to seeing God the Father in humanity as you're going to get. But the Spirit is not. And that makes it harder for us to get a hand. The Spirit, Jesus tells us, blows where it went. We can't control the Holy Spirit of God. We can't capture the dove and cage it, although we try to do that all the time. 
We try to get the Holy Spirit to do things we want it to do, as if we had a bird we were training. You know? Remember, he's the paraclete, not the parakeet. He's not a trainable bird. The Spirit carries out God's will wherever he is sent to do that. And sometimes he does that in ways that make us highly uncomfortable. But the fact is that now that the Son has returned to the presence of his Father, the Holy Spirit incorporates the apostles in that upper room and all the faithful into his actual body so that we make up that body. Remember the apostles, the, the apostles, because I know you celebrated Pentecost here, you heard the, the, the reading. You know, the apostles see Jesus depart from them, he returns to, to the heavens. And they're kind of, all they Peter, look at that. I wonder what that means. And finally, a couple of angels have to say, guys, focus. Why stand ye looking up at heaven? <laughs> the same Jesus who ascended will return. You know, your job, he gave you a job, is to go back to Jerusalem and wait to be empowered from on high. So they do that. And you got this period, maybe 10 days a week, between the ascension of our Lord and this day of Pentecost, the coming of the Feast of the Ascension, in which they go back a lot happier than they were certainly after Easter. But after e I, I'm sorry, after uh, Good Friday. After Good Friday, they assumed it was all over. They assumed they'd been conned, tricked bamboozled, whatever it might have been, until they encountered the risen Lord. But they go back happier men, but still rather timorous men. You know, they still were the ones who were hiding, so they, because they were afraid they were going to be identified as being with Jesus and that sort of thing. But it's on Pentecost when they receive the conviction, the confidence, the focus, the courage, and the power to take what they have experienced, an experience of a risen Lord which they knew personally, and to go out and begin to tell people about him. Peter, the fisherman, stands up in Jerusalem on Pentecost. Remember, this was a Jewish feast. So the Jews were already gathered to, 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 to celebrate Pentecost. Stands up in Pentecost and begins to talk to them about Jesus and the coming of the Spirit. And at the end of this, he speaks so powerfully. He says to them, this Jesus whom you crucified, which is a bold statement, which is, this is the same guy who ran and hit. This is the guy who denied Christ three times, standing up and proclaiming to his own people that the Messiah had come, that the prophecies of the prophet Joel, which we heard read this morning, were fulfilled, that the Spirit had come, and speaks so powerfully and to our knowledge, this is the first time he ever done so. The people are struck to the heart and say, what must we do? And he's repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. This group of men who are basically, essentially, groupies to a traveling rabbi who they were really attached to, suddenly no longer have a leader except God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that Jesus had sent. And they themselves, therefore, spread out as far as they can. We know Thomas got as far, at least as the Indies, it may not be exactly India, but at least far east. Others went north, others went west. All of them, except John the Evangelist, died as martyrs. Yet all of them had a tremendous impact wherever they went. They had the power to proclaim what before they'd been afraid of. So it incorporates them completely into the church and empowers them to be leaders of that church and empowers all faithful believers too. The other thing the Holy Spirit does, another thing, not the other thing, another thing the Holy Spirit does is what Jesus says. He will lead you into what? All truth. Our God is a jealous God. Had you suggested to the apostles they should slap a bumper sticker on their chariots that said coexist, they would have laughed at you. There was one God, they were preaching one God, they knew the truth about that one God, they were calling people. They preached Jesus, they preached a relationship with Jesus, and they called for a response. They were in a world which was about as pluralistic as you could imagine. Probably even more pluralistic than our own. We're trying to catch up. 
in which all kinds of gods and religions were competing for him. And in which, by the way, they could have had a, a perfectly secure place in the Roman Empire if they wished it. The Roman Empire could have cared less what Christians believed. They could have cared less had they worshipped a sacred mushroom as long as they also worship the other gods and the emperor. You got your sacred mushroom, that's cool, whatever turns you on. But you just fold that into the pantheon of the other gods, and it's, it's all right, it's okay. And this, of course, the Christians would not do, because they said there is only one Lord, one Gideon. This becomes particularly manifest in Antioch, which, of course, is on Mother Church. Because once the persecutions begin and people spread out, you know, the, 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 the most of the early Christians were Jews. They go to Antioch and they contact other Jews, but they start talking to Gentiles. And the Jews in Antioch were different from the Jews in Jerusalem. You know, the Jews in Antioch were Hellenized Jews. They'd, they'd seen the big city. You know, they'd seen the lights of the great white way. And in contact with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of cultures. Paul was one of them. He could speak Greek, he could speak Hebrew, probably knew Latin. You know, these people were, you know, people down from down on the farm. They had a broad knowledge of what was going on in the world. And the church, they knew intuitively at that point, and this is only the work of the Holy Spirit, that they couldn't preach the same way in Antioch, or in Alexandria, or in Rome, the way they had done in Jerusalem. Because having <coughs> been faithful Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah who filled the Old Testament, that's what they preached. The word in Hebrew is Mashiach. But they had preached the Mashiach in Antioch, no one would have known what they were talking about. They didn't know from Messiahs. They didn't know from prophets. They didn't know from the suffering servant of Isaiah. They worshipped Mithra. They worshipped Dionysius. They worshipped all kinds. They worshipped the emperor. But they certainly didn't worship the God of Israel. They wouldn't even know what the vocabulary was. And had they continued preaching in Antioch what they preached in Jerusalem, the church would have died right there. But the Holy Spirit worked. The Holy Spirit led. And they realized they had to change their vocabulary. Nobody in Antioch, except maybe a few of the Jews, knew what a Messiah was. But they certainly knew the word kidneys. Lord. And it's first there that Jesus is called Lord. Kidneys. And so they begin to preach about this Lord in opposition to Lord Mithra, Lord Dionysius, Lord the Emperor, whoever that might be. And if that had not happened, if the Spirit had not led them, and that's not an easy thing to do because you're abandoning your own culture. To change the language that you're talking in means that you're, chained, you're, you're abandoning, leaving behind the culture that you grew up in was comfortable with. This could not have been an easy thing to do. But this is how the Holy Spirit leads and guides. But it says the Holy Spirit leads into all truth. It means precisely that the truth that God reveals is always the truth that God reveals. We read in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God himself is impassable. There is no change in God, otherwise he wouldn't be God. But the situations that Christians find themselves in, as, say, between Jerusalem and Antioch. <laughs> the situations the church has to confront, historically, are different. So you can't do what you do in Antioch, what you do in Jerusalem, what you do in New York City. This is why when we look at the history of the church, we sometimes get bothered and confused. Because we see the same Orthodox church preaching the same gospel, calling people to believe the same doctrines, treating people differently in one period of history and geographical location than they might in another period of history and geographical location. And the reason is, people are not the same here as they are there, as the difference between Jerusalem and Antioch. And so, if you read through the history of the church, what you see is the Holy Spirit leading, to do, leading the church to do what is best at that time for those people who are encountering the gospel and for their salvation. And so at one time the church may be very, may be very severe and strict with people coming into the church. At another time it's much more gentle and kind. You'll find all things in here. You'll find canons that say to do this here 
and then a couple of hundred years later down the road, you find another canon that says, God, don't do that. What are you thinking? Because the circumstance that the church is facing, the preaching of the gospel, that, that is trying to preach the gospel in, is different. Because people, culture, language, all of these things, just we talked last night about the language of worship and how it affects music. Well, the same thing happens to affect the way we preach and discipline people. Even within personal ministries, a priest, if he is wise and listens to the Holy Spirit of God, often has to deal with different people in different manners about the same issue. Because different people have different levels of strength, different levels of commitment, different baggage they're hauling with them. And the priest has to be able to stand there when he's confronted about it, and this will happen, as to how come you treated them differently than me. Well, because frankly, you're stronger than we are. You're more of an adult than they are. You're more grown up. You can handle it. They cannot. This is what it means when it says the Holy Spirit leads us into more, you know, all truth. Not that there are new truths to be described. I mean, no, we don't believe there are. But the way in which that truth is applied to people and situations and problems and difficulties and pains and hurts, this requires the wisdom the Holy Spirit gives us to recognize that people are not stamped out of a cookie cutter and you can't pound round peg, and you can't pound a round peg into a square peg. But you can't pound a square peg into a round peg. This is why priests always have to invoke the Holy Spirit. This is why bishops, when they teach, always have to invoke the Holy Spirit. To be filled with it, to be guided by it, to be directed by it, to be that comforter, that counselor, that advocate. The word paracletos, paracletos, literally means an advocate in the sense that you would have an advocate for you in a court of law. But he's also described as the comforter. And sometimes the comforter is the whole, Holy Spirit, the only, I'm sorry, the only comforter, real comfort that we're going to have. I've read one translation where it said from the Latin, God will send someone else to befriend you. We can't take the spirit and nail it down the definition. Other than that is giving to us the uncreated life of God, communicating to us the life of the kingdom of heaven, communicating to us whatever gifts God knows that we need. And different people have different gifts. Go read Galatians and read about the fruits of the Holy Spirit chapter there, where it talks about love, friendship, patience, uh, repentance, and the last one, which we are so often lacking, self-control, the spirit of self-control. The spirit himself is a person as much as our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father are persons, but it's a different kind of experience. The spirit blows where he wills. He comes to us in whatever need we know. Paul tells us in Romans that if we cannot find the words to pray, the Spirit himself will pray with us with sighs and groans that are greater than words. We don't pray on our own. The Holy Spirit of God prays through us and supports the words that we send up to God. With the of and the Holy Spirit, above all things, is always renewing us and his church. The historic church was not something that existed in the past. The historic church is now, right here. Yeah, right here in Omaha, Illinois. This is the self-same church with the self-same teaching, but more than that, the self-same personal encounter with a personal God that transformed the lives of the 12, that transformed the lives of all those who heard him, and transforms the lives of all those who respond to his presence in our Father and of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit, God is one. I believe in God. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and for all things visible and invisible, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only
He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is saved by the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Establish the